And immigration is one of the main hot potato issues currently dominating campaigning in Britain's upcoming general election. With the main parties now striving to prove their toughness over the issue, it's perhaps rather timely that a new documentary has been released looking at the French port town of Calais, which desperate migrants escaping from violence have used as a gateway to England and the search for a new life. For well, the film, Calais, The Last Border, has been made by the award-winning documentary filmmaker Mark Isaacs, who now joins me in the studio. Very good morning to you, and thank you so much for coming in. <coughs> and there was no coincidence involved in this, but it, this, the, your film gives a whole immigration argument phenomenal context, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, actually, the film is being shown again in London this week, but it was made a few years ago. Um, and I went out there first of all when, the, do you remember in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a refugee camp mm. in Calais? Sangat. Sangat, yeah. And that, when I started making the film, that had just closed. So all the refugees, migrants that were in that camp just sort of left pretty much on the streets. And that's the sort of starting point of, of, of the film. So it sort of looked at, it's not just about refugees and migrants, mm. but it takes that as a theme to look at that town because Calais in itself is very transient. It's, you know, it's just constantly people coming and going. So the film looks at, people in transit and sure. there's a, a young man from Afghanistan a Jamaican guy who turns up just as they had introduced new laws to uh, require that Jamaicans have visas to enter the country so it looks at all those theme themes about freedom of movement and people in in a sort of transient state in a small little town. <laughs> yeah, but not, but not just those who are the transients from these different corners of the world, but also the local people themselves. Because in the UK, when we look at Calais, we see the whole issue of people coming over to England as a nuisance. The accusation is that the French authorities are not doing enough to clamp down on the problem. Yeah. But how do the residents of Calais view things? Well, I mean, because my language, my French language is quite limited. I, I, I mean, I, I did speak to a few residents of Calais. Um, but actually, I filmed a lot of English people in the town who go across and, um, you know, to buy... Well, at that time, you could buy cheap alcohol and cheap cigarettes. I think that's sort of stopped a bit now. So I did... I looked at those people, you know, and who would be reacting, you know, and creating sort of Daily Mail headlines um, from back home. And... Because they were sort of side by side with the refugees in the mm. town. You know, they were there shopping, and the, and the migrants and refugees were there, you know, desperately trying to kind of cross the sea, and they would often you know, ask if they could go in their cars, etc. So it's quite an interesting kind of confrontation in that very sort of limited space. Um, and I did speak to a few lo local French people who, you know, were kind of just sort of bemused as to why these people were just left, you know, in the town, wandering the streets. I mean, they were, at some point, the migrants there were, and the refugees were offered um, residency in France, but most of them wanted to come to England. They weren't interested in staying mm. in France. But what was it about England that attracted them? Because the view from over here mm -hmm. is that England is seen as, as marvellous to, to foreigners because of the benefit system. It's regarded as being overly generous and that that brings people here. Also, the use of the National Health Service. So if you have to pay for health care in the country you're leaving, you don't have to pay for it in the UK. Is it really as cliched as that? Well, there's a lot of myths about that, I think. And, um, and the myths also perp uh, perpetrated by the smugglers as well. They kind of say, oh, yeah, you can go to England and, you know, claim any benefits, it's a wonderful life, etc. I mean, there's linguistic ties that I think are really important. Mm. And there's, you know, especially uh, people from Afghanistan at that time. Um, you know, the, the, there was also the, you know, there's the fact that there's a community over here already that these people would kind of get go into and find a kind of home for themselves. I think that's important. And that goes back sort of to... You know, there's a mm. character in the film is from Jamaica, and you know, obviously had, has lots of ties over here, and there's a familiarity linguistically. Uh, but there's definitely those myths about benefits sure. and all of that, which sort of get kind of played out Wrapped on both sides, the, from the, the left narrative. and the right. You know, but is there also a sense as well that you mentioned their countries like Afghanistan, because one of the criticisms, I suppose, that's been levelled at Britain is that okay, the United Kingdom got involved in the war in Afghanistan, and that once the situation had reached a point where troops could safely withdraw the people, the promises, etc., had been left behind. And is there a sense, for example, that some Afghan refugees are coming over to Calais to get to the UK on the grounds of, hang on a minute, you made a promise, and we're here to collect on that promise, to force you to deliver? Yeah, I mean, there was a sense of, you know, that, that England is a sort of civilised, democratic country and they should help out and, you know, and, and sort of help these people that are in desperate need. I mean, at the time I was making the film, actually, they were starting to send people back on, on sort of secret flights back to Afghanistan. 
um, when they considered things were okay, and they clearly weren't. You know, mm. and so this was the French authorities working in collusion with their British <coughs> counterparts. Well, I think that once they got to England, there were like special deportation flights happening at that time. Um, I think they've sort of stopped now because mm. it's different populations now. But um, you know, this is all still going on in Calais very much. I know, I know now because there's a woman in the film who's actually. British, but she ended up living in Kelly. Um, she was a refugee from the Second World War. I speak to her really regularly about what's happening there now, and there's because there's the camp obviously closed, and there's been nothing to replace it. People, it hasn't stopped people sort of turning up. Um, and, and that's, you know, the, that's the other point that I was going to raise as well, because you've got when, when you had Sangat, you had a discernible structure because that was run by the Red Cross. Yeah, it's Red Cross. And again, pressure from both the French and the British authorities, they forced the closure. So when people come over, where are they going? Because clearly, no one's going to take them into their homes. Some of the local uh, collisions, as they call them, have, have you know, uh, connected to, to churches there, have, have helped people out and, and have taken people into their homes. But, um, but are they very few? Or? Most just end up wandering the streets trying to you know, get across at night, either in the back of lorries or on the trains. I mean, this is pretty impossible. I mean, lorries are still possible. It's still, you know, the lucky ones get across like that. But, the, you know, the, in the beginning, the whole rail system was quite open. You could just jump on the back of a train mm. and then... You know, every day these kind of huge fences would be erected, and it became like a, the whole town became like a sort of um, camp in itself. You know, mm. surrounded by fences and borders everywhere. You know, it's kind of but when people actually provide shelter, be it yeah. through the church or some other organisation, mm. are they condemned by other people? Are they seen as somehow aggravating a problem because you're giving aid, shelter to people who shouldn't be here? They haven't entered the country legally. Yeah, I'm sure that some of the local people also felt that too. But I mean, I don't, you know, I think. It depends on who you are as a person. I don't, you know, it's. I don't think you can generalise about it. There are a lot of people that just really wanted to help help them out, and you know, they, they were provided food, etc. But the, you know, one of the problems was the, the, you know, the people didn't want to stay there. The refugees didn't want to stay in Calais, of course. They were their whole sort of uh, ambition was to, to cross the Channel. So even if they were staying in people's homes, they were still at night trying to get across. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that was their main purpose for being there. Which is very dangerous as well. Yeah, yeah, like it's totally totally insane you know people jumping on the back of trains and you know holding on to sort of uh, back of lorries and all of that I mean I used to see that all the time they would lorries would park up in petrol stations and people would sort of cut the cut their way into the, to the lorry and sleep there all night in the hope that it would end up in somewhere in England but they could get out of um, the lorry in Hull or somewhere they have no idea where they are mm. and you know and that's where their sort of life starts in over here so some of them did actually manage to make the crossing to England even yeah, though you do, you've yeah. got tight no, restrictions yeah yeah because it's only, you know it's sort of although there are sort of machines that detect detect oxygen levels etc the, the technology is really kind of you know it was really upped in that during that time but um, there's always people that could you know beat mm. the system okay the there is a trailer for the documentary which I believe is now ready to roll so let's watch it Calais the last border Very lucky people. We say it every morning when we get up. What do you say? Aren't we the luckiest people in the world? That's what we say, don't we? Yeah. And coffee down, okay? You've got your hands down to you? It's all chips. It's a cup of chart. What's that? Ketchup, please. What sauce do you like? Uh, tomato, please. Tomato. We are sleeping here. You can see this is our. We are, we are sleeping at night. Please, sir, there we are sleeping. Please, sir, come here. There is a very dirty place. We are sleeping at the night like this, sir. This is this is for night, sir. In the minus six temperature, like this, you can see, sir. This is it. This is our blanket. This is our blanket for the for the night, sir. <laughs> Sir, would you like to make your show? Would you like? I'm okay. Okay, you are okay. <laughs> you know?
It's just astonishing watching this, the stark contrast between the booze cruisers, the yeah. Brits drinking their tea, eating their fish yeah. and chips, <laughs> and then, of course, you've got the story that's going on, the other, the other back story, yeah. and the conditions in which some of these people were living. I mean, very, very grim, but also just seeing those industrial drums there, quite dangerous as well. Yeah, I mean, people would sleep anywhere they could, really, and a drum suddenly becomes a roof over someone's head, you know, mm. it's kind of, it was like that. I mean, and now I know that, you know, it's harder for them to sleep in those sort of more urban areas that a lot of the current refugees uh, are living out in the forests there you know mm. is, but it was you know of course it was like freezing during the winter sure. and but how did people perilous. keep warm as well because you know you, you're right it's, yeah. it's very cold in france during the winter so how do people keep themselves warm in those conditions there was a you know again people gave blankets and, and and things like that and there was also a sort of structure in place so in the morning they could go to a certain area and get breakfast and they, they could have hot tea etc then there was a sort of lull of a few hours before lunchtime when people would come again and give food the problem was during those sort of lulls, if they were caught wandering around the town or, you know, just picked up by the police, often the French police would just drive people to the German border and dump them there. So they become somebody else's problem, Yeah, basically. exactly, and then they'd just come, come back again, you know, but if you got caught two or three times, then you'd be detained and, you know, but it was, uh, and they were offered, you know, uh, asylum by the French, but as I said, you know, most didn't want to take that. They Why did they refuse French asylum? What was it about France that made it an unacceptable place to be? Um, it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, in Calais, obviously, they'd arrived there and things were quite hostile and, uh, and they just didn't want to be there. It was just a sort of stepping stone on the way to England. Um, mm. I think from the beginning, they had no intentions of staying in France. And, you know, I think once you've got your mind made up on somewhere, and probably a lot of them have, you know, had connections, spoken sure. to people that were here in London. A lot, of course, wanted to go to London, not just England. It's about yeah. getting to London. You know, and having some sort of, you know, community to, 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 mm. to become a part of. So a I network. Think, to yeah, a network to. and to start a mm. life, you know, and it's complicated in France as well because they have a national identity card scheme which is really different. I mean, in London I think it's quite easy to hide. Yes, I mean, and blend in. Yeah, I mean, you need, obviously, if you need healthcare, etc., and you need to become part of, of, the, of the system, then you're going to have problems. But basically, because there's no national ID card, and you can't, when you can get, you, I guess you can get stopped on the street and asked to mm. show who you are. But in France, this ID card is quite crucial. And, you know, you can, at any moment, if you don't have that, if you're stopped and don't have that, your papers, then you really mm. are in trouble. You know? We've got about one minute left, but I'm fascinated to know how you were able to get so close to people so that they would be willing to share their stories with you. Because there must have been some initial suspicion when you come at them with a the camera. Sure, yeah, being, no, of course. My gosh, you know, aren't you part of the authorities, aren't you? Can try and send us back. Yeah, I mean, it's about, it's about time. I mean, I made that film over six or seven months, so I sort of, I, I wasn't living there, but I was living there for a few weeks, and I'd come back, see my family for a bit, and go back out there. So it's, it was pretty much, you know, time with people, and so they understand what you're doing, and also then, you know, you're not just like mm. a news crew. Sure. Kind of, you know, and presumably, though, you can't be untouched, you can't be immune when you hear some of these stories about what people have persecuted. No, not at all. I mean, it's, I mean that, the Afghani guy that we saw there, you know, breaks down at different points and it's mm. really, it's really moving and, sure. you know, so it's hard, but you feel like compelled to sort mm. of tell those stories.